Well, um, thank you everybody for jumping on today. Um, when, when Mara and I were talking about just, you know, this class and some of the opportunities around this class, um, this is definitely one that I'm, I'm passionate about and uh, have, have really enjoyed speaking about in the past. So today we are talking about um, CMAs or comparative market analysis and um, pricing homes to sell. So making sure that we are setting up our clients for success uh, through through listings. So um, is I don't know if everyone's here where we're at, but right now um, locally, geographically, are most people here in the Willamette Valley area or surrounding areas? I believe so. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm from Portland. Okay, awesome. Appreciate it. Okay, so um, most of our markets are going to work very, very similar. But right now, the, the big thing that I want to just start us off with is from a baseline understanding on what is a CMA and truly how do we use it in a either a listing presentation or within an active listing. And so there's two parts to that. Um, when we talk about pricing a home to sell in today's market, the big thing that we need to focus on is knowing the information that is important to gather when putting together an actual analysis of what the home should sell for in today's market. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you who spend time watching um, the active pending sold market, you're going to see a number of homes that go pending within a day and a number of homes that ultimately take 30 to 45 days or 60 days to go pending. Um, so really when we start looking at what does it mean to price it to sell? Is that at market value? Is that above market value? Is that below market value? And really the, the, the important thing for people to understand is that in, in sellers especially, is that we're not in the same market that we probably were two, three you know, years ago. And when it comes to pricing strategies, we need to be very specific on understanding a couple of key aspects. A, the fundamentals of the CMA. So do we know how to look at comparable homes, value them based on when they sold, some of the key characteristics that make them unique and why they possibly sold in the market for the price that they did? Um, we need to look at the existing home. So oftentimes people come up and they'll say, Zillow says my house is worth 650000 And we're going to have to look at that and say, okay, one set of data tells us six fifty. dollars it's Zillow. And it's going to be in the back of our, the minds of our seller throughout this entire conversation. We're going to either overcome it or we're going to verify it. Now, for those of you who maybe don't know all about Zillow and their strategy for Zestimate or the pricing structure that they give, they're basically taking zip codes and they're going off price per square foot. They're going off bedrooms and bathrooms uh, and lot size. And when you think about that, there's a lot of other factors that are going to go into the home that are going to potentially change that price as much as 30%. I, I mean, I don't have everyone on screen here, but um, I'd be curious to know how many people have walked into a home that was listed for sale that did not fit the neighborhood. I mean, you, you walk up to the door and you look at the house and it's either recently been remodeled in an older neighborhood and it's, it's the it's the crown jewel of the neighborhood. It's the diamond in the rough. It's the one that doesn't fit. And it's possibly going to, you know, not be even comparable to a lot of the homes that are nearby. You also have the alternative, which is when you walk into a home, it's in a nice newer neighborhood. And the owners for the last two years have deferred maintenance. They have not taken care of the home. They haven't added any upgrades. They haven't done anything to the home. And it doesn't fit the neighborhood. So this goes both ways. And when we talk about values and just simply putting a number on it, we have to get eyeballs on the house before we ever start looking for comparable sales. There's no, in my opinion, important um, part of the, the, the real estate's job or realtor's job in listing in making sure we don't get the cart before the horse 
with getting eyeballs on a house before preparing and presenting a CMA. So often I hear people say, I'm going to do a CMA. I'm going out to a listing appointment. I say, have you seen the house? No, but I'm going to, they really want a CMA before I, you know, for when I go. This should be a huge red flag for, for anyone who's in this situation because you can't find comparables for the house that you're going to see until you've seen it and you know the condition, you know the upgrades, you know the deferred maintenance, you know the uniqueness of the house. Um, and, and those are all huge, important factors. Now, let's say you're in a, in a neighborhood. We're just going to use an example here for this particular point. You're in a neighborhood that was recently built. All the homes are the exact same. They are within 100 square feet of each other. They're all similar condition. And you're, the house that you're going to look at, you drove by and it looks like it fits the neighborhood. It looks like everything else. Everything should be in line, right? What's the second factor that we need to be considering when we're talking about pricing the house? This is the question for anyone to jump in on. Um, hey. Hey. M maybe the condition of the house, how old it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's say the condition of the house fits the neighborhood and everything's the exact same as the neighbor's house that just recently sold or the three other houses that sold very similar. What, what, what else do we need to make sure we're, we're taking into play when we're pricing a house to sell in today's market? So it should, when we are considering the neighbor's house, it should be within the three months of the, uh, the that, that timeline. Okay. So think about there's the house and there's one more aspect that goes into this. And it's, it's interesting because it's not about the house itself. And that's my little clue here. The location. Okay. So location is, is part of it. It's still about the house. What's one more aspect that is important to think about when you're pricing a house to sell in today's market? Um, interest rates. Okay. Could be a factor. Payment, affordability. What was the, what was the interest rate when that house next door sold? Sure. The neighborhood what, what else? built. What was that? The year is built. Okay. So age of the home, that's still about the house itself. That's going to go into your number crunching side of things. What about the motivation of the seller? Not to market price. Um... So when we think about two different sellers and we're talking about getting a house sold and we're saying <clears throat> their timeline is they need to sell it tomorrow. And if we're looking at, we, we ran all the numbers and we came up with a range that's got a 3% variance plus or minus. Are we going to price it at the highest price point? Or are we going to price it at the lower price point if they have to get it sold tomorrow? Lowest. Right. So this is why I think when, when we talk about actually helping clients get to the end goal of getting a house sold, we can all run the numbers. We can get the house looked at. We can we can go through the process of putting together a CMA, but our CMA is going to have a variance. Is there going to be a, a little bit of a difference in what the numbers suggest the house should sell for and what the market will, will value it? Both pro and con, right? There's going to be a little bit of a variance there. And sellers need to be aware of this. And we need to go in there with eyes wide open and, and help them open their eyes in the fact that the numbers suggest your house should sell for 700. It could sell for 690 and it could sell for 710. Okay. Right? And if we are someone, a seller who says, listen, I absolutely have to get the most for my home. I need to start at the highest price point. Then we know that the problem is that seven ten you know, side of the the spectrum. If someone comes to you and says, "I need to get it sold tomorrow," it has to sell tomorrow. We're probably not going to list it at seven ten. We're probably not going to be as patient as someone who needs to sell tomorrow. So, just keep that in mind. It's definitely the fine tuning of a CMA in providing the right advice to sellers in today's market.
Because what's the last thing we want as a listing agent after 60 days or 90 days of being on the market? What's the last thing we want? To be sent there. Still be on the market. <laughs> the last thing we want is to get a phone call from the seller that says, I'm trying something else with a different agent. And I can almost promise you, if you've been listed at the high price point and haven't changed your price and you're still there, when they relist with that new agent, they're not going to be at the same price. So let's take a couple steps back now and work through some of the nuts and bolts, if you want to call it that, of creating a CMA. When we start to compare houses between each other, and we're starting to talk about house A and house B, we ran through this scenario when there's a neighborhood and all the houses are built the same, they're all built at the same time, almost feels like the Truman Show. It's one of those planned neighborhoods where they're all the same. Very, very simple and very straightforward with getting a price put together. Uh, as someone mentioned, you know, interest rates, uh, Santosh, I think that was you, but interest rates can be a factor. If a house sold seven months ago and interest rates were at seven and a half and they're today, they're at seven, maybe the value went up a little bit. If the last sale was at 6% and now we're at 8%, value is probably not going to be there. So um, definitely a factor. Now, the complicated thing is, is that unless you're in a market that is primarily dominated by homes that fit that criteria, you're going to be challenged with creating CMAs and reports for homes that don't have a twin brother or sister on the same block. You're going to be challenged with taking key factors about a property and being able to adjust them based on homes that are similar or homes that should have been similar based on the price point, location, or condition. Does that make sense? So when we talk about making adjustments, um, I don't know who, okay, can't see everybody, but has anybody, has everybody done a comparative market analysis either for a client or for fun or for practice? Put together a list of 10 to 12 homes that are similar to the house that you're trying to get a price for. Has everyone, have you done that yet? You should? No? Okay. So... We'll take one more, step, just kind of a quick little summary here, then we'll go back a little bit just to give you a baseline. Um, when putting together a comparative market analysis, you are going to have a subject property. This is the house. This is the, you know, the house that you're going to try to sell. It's one, two, three Elm Street. Elm Street is located in the Northwest area of a town. And one, two, three Elm Street is 1500 square feet, three bedrooms, two bathrooms, and is built in the year 2000. Okay, so when we think about that, we're going to try and find comparatives. We're going to try to find a list of homes. The most recent homes are the best homes, but we're going to try and find homes that are similar to that property. Now, we're probably not going to search the South. So neighborhood specific. Uh, excuse home. me. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm not sure if it was just for me, but you cut out for the last two minutes. Uh oh. Did anybody else hear me or no? You paused for a bit, but now, now it's normal. Wait, okay. We'll keep going here. See if I can go back there. Uh, okay. So when we talk about, you know, the homes that we're searching for and what we're, we're putting together in a list of comparable homes, first thing I like to do is narrow down the area that we're gonna be searching for criteria. So area first, typically you'd like to stay in as tight of a circle as possible around the subject home, meaning maybe it's a half mile and let's start there. And then we're gonna go start with our criteria. We're gonna start with the size of the house, so square footage. So if our subject home is 1500 square feet, how far off of 1500 square feet are we gonna search? Plus an up and down. Two miles. Okay, that's for distance, but size-wise of the house. How If our house is 1,500 square feet, how much bigger and how much smaller are we going to be looking at for comparables? 200 square feet. Okay. That, that would probably be a little bit on the higher side, but yeah, I think you could do it. I like to start, and this is where I say start because this is kind of a, it's a, it's a, a process. Start with 10% up and 10% down. 
So if you have 1,500 square feet, you're going down to 1,450 and up to 1,650. Okay. Now, three bed and two bath. Are we going to use homes that are three bed and one bath? Not initially. All right. Initially, we're going to find as many exact three bedroom, two bath houses as we can find. So I like to leave bedrooms and bathrooms as they are for my first go around. Okay. So three bed, two bath houses, 1,400, excuse me, 1,350 square feet to 1,650. Not 14, excuse me. Okay. Um, now, years built. If a house is built in 2000, is that going to be the same as a house built in 2022? Is it going to be the same as a house built in 1950? Try to stay within a 10 year window, plus and minus. Okay. Start there. So 10%, this is this is where, where CMAs can be pretty systematic. 10%, 10 years. Okay. So now we have narrowed it down. So we have homes that are between 1990 and 2010. So probably going to be pretty similar from a stylistic fashion. Probably going to be pretty similar from the number of repairs and the condition of the houses. Um, and then what we're also going to do is we're gonna look at lot size. So depending on the property that you're dealing with, if it's in the city, it's probably gonna have somewhere between a 0 0.08 acre lot and maybe a third of an acre lot. Well, let's say the house we're working with right now has 0.16 of an acre. That's the lot size, 0.16. It's like 7,200 square feet, right? Um, so what you're gonna do now is you're gonna go, okay, let's plus and minus that. I probably use a, a, a different variance there, but it's a plus one. Uh, so I go 0 0.06 to 0 0.26. So 0 0.1 or 0 0.10. Again, back with the tens. And you're going to hit search. And you're going to look for things that sold in the last three months. Now, if we do this... I have a okay, question. Go ahead. So... For the area you said it would be how will we calculate the area? Will we use the same zip code or how? I didn't know. I don't use this. I mean, it depends on your neighborhoods and how your where your demographic looks like. Uh, like here in Eugene, if we use the same zip code, it could get two very different neighborhoods in different parts of the area. So I like to take a circle. I do a, a map. I do I draw a map. I go to the map search in MLS and I'll draw a circle around the area. Um, I try to keep it within about a mile. A mile. For the most part. Okay. Um, and again, this is where we're going to tweak and play with things a little bit. So this is our first run through of it. We're first time going through searching to see what we come up with. Well, let's say we come up with two homes. Okay. We only came up with two homes. Do we have enough information to price our home? Say no. Okay. So if we only have two homes, we don't have enough information and we have to make some changes. So we would go back to our search criteria and we would expand it slightly. First thing we do is we start with the area. We search a little bit farther out and okay. hit count or see how many homes fall in that area. Let's say we get four or five now, right? And then what I'll probably do from that is say, okay, let, let's go a little farther back in time. Let's go five months. Let's take a look at five months. Now we get seven or eight, okay? And maybe I, I want to get to about, I really want to get to about 12 or 14 homes because I'm going to pick 10 from that list that I really like or nine or 10. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to maybe change bathrooms to a three, one and a half or possibly a four bed, two bath home. And I'm going to include those homes. And let's say I do that. And all of a sudden I get 22. It jumps up dramatically. Okay, now I can probably go back and I can tighten up some of the other criteria, maybe the area, maybe I shrink the area down a little bit. And so what you're doing slowly is you're, 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 you're trying to tighten that search in to get the most accurate information in the homes that most fit the criteria that matches the home you're, you're getting ready to price. And is this is where having knowledge and an understanding of different areas and different price points uh, will be really helpful for you because you'll want to exclude certain listings that pull up in that. Maybe there's a brand new neighborhood 
in the middle of Old Town where homes were selling for $600 a square foot and everything else is selling for $400 a square foot. You have to be able to know that. So then you get your list and you're going to go through and you're going to take a look at each one of them because remember, we've already been to the subject house. We've already walked through it. We've seen it with our own eyes. We know what it looks like, what it smells like, what it feels like. And we can go through the list of the homes that we just pulled up and we can select again, between eight and 10 homes from that list that we're going to carry over to our CMA. Everybody do still you, with me? Do you only look at the sold one or do you look at like active or? So here's what I'll do is I'll include in my, in my CMA, maybe one or two actives that are really closely related. Pendings are, I'll put in there, just depending on how many days on market they've been um, and what kind of their original list price and what they went pending at. The, the big thing is sold to the most important because if a house, let's say, but you list, a, or let's say Haley lists a house for $7.99 in the neighborhood that you're about to list a house for in the same neighborhood and she lists the house at $7.99 and you walk in there and you're like, this doesn't feel like this could be any more than six fifty. Well, if you have a comparable in there at seven ninety nine, and you use that as a data point, and that house has been sitting active for thirty days, no offers, no activity, and no price changes. Is that a good comparison? And does that price help you or hurt you? It's going to hurt you. It's not going to help anything because you're all you're getting is the data point on a on a. Uh, pricing for a house that isn't selling. We don't want two houses not selling. Let them do their thing. If they overprice, they overprice. Our job is to give our clients and our sellers a realistic price point that's going to help them get their house sold in today's market. That's our job. That's our only job. So some actives, maybe use them one or two just to show them. Um, and maybe if you if you want to, you can put a couple of them in there and say, look, these these are two active houses that are priced at you know four hundred and fifty dollars a square foot that are very similar to yours, and they've been on the market for thirty days and they're not selling. So let's not. We know that there's a there's a threshold where people are willing to pay, and that's too high. So primarily focus on the solds because that's going to give you accurate data. The second thing with pendings, unless you actually can reach out to the agent, the agent's willing to tell you what they went pending for. You really don't know anything other than the current list price. Fair? Okay. So once you get those, those lists of homes, you pull them into your CMA and you're looking at it and you're thinking, okay, I know what my subject house looks like. I know what these look like. You can actually go through and make little adjustments for them and say, this house right here is very, very similar, but it's got fully updated kitchens and bathrooms. That's probably worth in today's market, let's say $25,000 adjustment. Or if it's a high-end home, maybe it's a little bit more of an adjustment, but you have to make little tweaks for each of those homes that you look at and say, okay, what is this house really worth in today's market versus the one that sold? If I was gonna be showing my client as a buyer, house A and, and house B, which are they gonna choose? They're probably gonna like the house that's nicer that has more updates. So just know that we're, we're in a competition world and we have to price accordingly. Is that fair? Does that make sense? But do you have the, the amount? Like if it's three beds and two baths and three beds and 1.5 baths and how much price do you adjust? Is there a rate for that? So there's not a set data point for that. And here, and here's what I think you can do is if you have a local appraiser, um, they do classes a lot on general appraising. They're, they're, they're pretty frequent. I would strongly suggest attending one of those classes because it will be very helpful in understanding how they come up with their values and how they make their adjustments. Um, different neighborhoods and different houses and different price points are going to be uh, affected differently based on that. Like is the is a house that goes from a three two to a three one and a half impacted more, more or less than a house that goes from four three to four two and a half? 
right? What's the adjustment there? And they might say that, that adjustment at, you know, is $2,500 for the bigger house and it's, and it's 7,500 for the smaller house because having two bathrooms at a minimum is important or a valuable add from a values perspective. Does that make sense? So it's not really an exact answer. It's gonna depend on the house, it's gonna depend on the situation. And the same thing with updated house versus a non-updated house. Bigger houses, there's probably gonna be a, a, you know, there's a higher cost to update a larger home. So in that particular market, maybe an updated house has a bigger gap or bigger adjustment that gets made for updates because of the costs that go into it. So, any more questions before we go a little, a little further? Okay, so we've got our 10 houses, we've walked through, we've done some adjustments. We've talked to our sellers and we know that they are wanting to move in the next 30 days. They're, they're comfortable. Um, they're not necessarily trying to fire sale the house. And so we've, we've got a price. We came to a price. We have a, our numbers here and the average price per square foot is $300. And our house is a hundred or excuse me, 1500 square feet. No, sorry. Our, our, our price per square foot is a little bit trickier. Our price per square foot is $302. Okay. Everybody got a character there? $302 price per square foot. Okay. Our house is 1,500 square feet. What are we going to price this house at? 453. Okay. One answer 453. Is that what you're actually going to price it at, or is that what the numbers come to? That's what the numbers come to. Okay. So if this is the data that we get and we're going to recommend a price to the seller, what price are you going to recommend to the seller? We have a chat. We do. All right. In the chat window, everybody write their price, what they're going to list the house at. Can you please repeat the figures again? Uh, it's a 1,500 square foot house. Price per square foot is on average for homes that have sold that are comparable uh, is $302 per square foot. Okay. Okay, got one answer. Okay, we got one, two, three answers in so far. Anybody else want to fire one off and fire off a guess? Haley's there, 453, okay. 453, okay. So the numbers come in at 453. So this is what the numbers say. Now, when it comes to pricing a home, what is our job as the realtor in this process? Come up with a number and put the sign in the yard. Make some cookies, put them out, make it smell nice. No, we are, we are marketing a home to the masses. Okay. So coming up with the CMA, the CMA clearly states that the house is worth $453,000 in today's market. That's what the numbers on paper say. Now, if this was commercial, and we were doing a commercial building sale where people are only about numbers. And if the numbers work, the numbers work. It would be one thing. What do we know about individuals who are buying a home for themselves? They tend to stray from the numbers specifically, right? If we look at the 10 houses that we have a CMA of, the average comes out to 302. I guarantee that there are some that are 296. There are some that are 315. They're going to be all over the place. So we now have an average we can go to our sellers and say, the numbers that I put together show your house should be worth $453,000. My job as your agent is to do one primary goal, is to market 
the heck out of this house to as many people as possible and get as many eyeballs on this home as possible so that we can get as many interested, willing and able buyers through that front door. What happens if we price the house at 453,000? We reduce the number of buyers that would potentially come through. Okay. What happens if we price it at 425,000? Maybe we'll get a little more um, attention. Okay. But what have we, we, and we might end up getting an offer only for 425 because that's the list price and that's what someone pays. Maybe we get multiple offers and we get, we get a little bit more. So we have to be pretty careful on when we're making adjustments from the number value and how far we're making those adjustments. So with this being said, if our job is to market the heck out of this property, Who's been on Zillow or Redfin and done a home search? Raise your hand. Yep, yep, okay. What increments of dollar amounts do they typically go in when you're searching? Or even on MLS for that matter? Is that 5K? Someone say 25,000. 25,000, there we go, got a winner. So a lot of home searches still will use $25,000 increments for home searches when you actually create filters and do bubbles, like when you move the slide bars in and over. Um, $25,000 um, tends to be a pretty typical one across the board. Some of the newer, better websites will be more adjustable. However, again, we're not trying to limit exposure. We're trying to get the maximum. So what we're doing is we're going to appeal to all websites, all search tools, and realistically, 25,000 is the increment. So if we list this house at 453,000 and someone's search criteria stops at 450,000, are we going to get eyeballs on the house from that particular buyer? Maybe. Not going to say 100% no, but realistically, we're probably going to miss 50% of the buyers who stop at 450 because they're not looking at 455, they're not looking at 460 because they can't afford it and they're just not trying it. They're not doing it. So in the, this situation, I would explain to my seller, our goal, again, is to get visibility and get as many people to come through the house, to see what you've done to it and to get as many opportunities for, for an offer as possible. So I would suggest listing this house at $450,000. Let's say, hold on, let's see here. Let's do this number. I'm doing one more number here. 1,500 square foot house. And it's coming in at 307 per foot. Or let's say, three, let's say 309. Yeah, there you go. 309 a square foot. Same 1500 square foot house. Now, what do we do? Okay. So different ideas, right? So now I've, and this is where you as a listing agent gets to design, decide your style and how you're going to communicate with, with, with sellers and with, um, with listing it or act, when acting as a listing agent, there's not a right or wrong answer here. What there is, is there's an opportunity to provide our seller with options. The house comes in at 463, 500. When you run the numbers, that's the numbers. So when we talk to our sellers, say, these are the numbers. This is where it comes in. We're not close enough to 450. We're not close enough to 475 to try to 
get to a, uh, what I call a goalpost. So um, in this situation, I'm going to give you a couple options. We can list it at 463, 500. And when the other agents go to show it, they're going to say, why is this number what it is? Because we literally write off the numbers and most agents are going to probably find the same thing. We can list it a little bit lower at that 450 number still. If the seller is motivated enough and wants to get the house sold, or 460 is probably a good round number and hoping with the $10,000 increments, we can stay within that, 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 that space of still being able to get visibility and not going outside of the realm of where we should list. Does that make sense? Does the idea of making the, the situation fit the seller and also making sure that the seller has the input to make those decisions? And now you've seen there's how many people on this call? One, two, three, four, five, six, six people. Everyone's going to have a different recommended price to give to that seller. Your job as the agent is to be able to explain and back up your justification for that price. If you said 450, 450 isn't wrong because here's how you're going to pitch it and here's why you're going to say that price. We're going to get more people through the door. We're going to have multiple open houses. We're going to have all kinds of marketing going out. And the idea and the goal is to drive up the price through multiple offers. Or maybe it's an as-is sale at that price. You can say the alternative, right? We're going to go at 463, 500 because that's where the numbers come back. And that's where I want you to see you get the most amount of value and, and, and money for your home in the sale of this property. And you're not needing to sell it tomorrow and it wouldn't be the end of the world. You just need to know that when you're pricing a home, you're taking into consideration a couple of different factors. The house itself, being able to price it, the motivation of the seller, and then your style and how you're going to present it and how you're going to be able to confidently believe that what you're presenting and how you're doing it is correct. Does that make sense? All right. That's the general process for pricing a home to sell. Doing a CMA is the numbers. Pricing a home to sell is the art, is the skill, is the ability that's going to get you listings because you're going to be able to go into that, that meeting. You're going to be able to go in there and sit down and talk confidently with a seller why you're coming in with a price because there's a very good chance that they're going to meet with myself, they're going to meet with Haley, they're going to meet with Ryan, and they're going to pick the, the agent that they want to represent them. So whatever price you decide on after running the numbers, be prepared and be ready to, to back it up with a plan and a process and even more data that justifies why you want to do that. Cool? All right. Who here has, or raise your hand if you work in a rural or have rural area around where your kind of service area is. You have rural homes, homes that don't look like other stuff, really just don't fit anything at all. They're very unique. Okay. What about older homes, like uh, historic homes or things that are just very unique? Anybody have those? Okay. Ryan, you're in Southern. Okay, great. So this doesn't just apply to um to historic homes or to a rural property pricing unique homes is absolutely imperative that you understand the property and understand the value of that home and it's going to take you a little bit longer so just be aware of that and here's what i'd say that there's a couple of different approaches to creating a value. We talked about one where we ran through the numbers, we found the comparative homes, and we found homes that you know would be similar price points because of where they're located in the neighborhood that they ran into the size and excuse me, size and square feet. When you come into a unique home, you have to look at it in a couple of different ways. There's the pricing of numbers, then there's the second way, which I like to use on occasion, which is a little bit challenging, but I have a buyer who has a $700,000 budget and they're looking at historic homes. Is home A more desirable than home B? Or 
Is home B more desirable than home A? Home B sold for six seventy five. Okay, now we look at again home A, which is our subject home, and home C. This one sold for seven twenty five. And you're going to have to use things other than just straight numbers to come up with a value. And this can be a really tricky process, and you're going to have to probably play with things, and you're probably going to have to go a little farther back into history because there's probably not as many that match or look and fit that criteria. And you're going to have to really work with and tweak the numbers based on a lot of the different criteria of the home. What is the value of the home? What is the, or excuse me, like what is the the intrinsic value? I mean, what, why would someone want this home over the other? Is it closer, you know, walking to shops? Is this part of the name? Hey, Ryan, not sure what happened there. Hopefully, uh, thanks for jumping back in. Hopefully, everybody else kind of hops back in here as well, and we'll get going. We'll get going. Oh, no problem. It said uh, host has ended the meeting. Yeah, and mine said the same thing. It wasn't me. Okay. All right. <laughs> thanks. Um, so can I take a poll of, of those that are there? Who uh, Who's with RMLS? Uh, I am. Me too. Okay. Me too. Okay, great. Um, man, it's a bummer how that, how that ended. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure who hit the wrong button, but uh, I'm not taking responsibility because it was not me. <laughs> um, so luckily though, Brian kind of was getting to the end of his kind of CMA theory that he was talking about. And then we were going to do breakout rooms. Um, and RMLS. Hey. Hey, not sure what happened there. Me neither. Um, too many cooks in the kitchen, I guess. I'm not sure. But yeah, if you want to finish up uh, what you were saying with these guys, go right yeah, ahead. I'll up, up real quick. And, then I'll, uh, and I'll take them with me to do the CMA. Awesome. Perfect. Sounds great. Um, so like I was just trying to say, though, there's, there's situations where you're going to have a unique property. Um, this is where just honestly experience and looking at different properties, getting a gut feeling for what things are going to be for. And you're going to have to um, use a lot more of the data that you can find from a bigger demographic, and a larger search area. They're, they're not easy. They take a lot of skill. They take a lot of work. Uh, definitely lean on some of your, your business partners, some of your leaders in your offices uh, when you have one of those unique situations. Because even after seven, eight years in, in this business, um, I come across properties that I can't price perfectly. Um, and it's it's going to take you know a lot of expertise. Um, for example, we did a timber property that was 145 acres of timber. What's the value of that? I'm not the expert. I had to go find somebody. So just know that different homes and different things that are unique uh, will require some some real hands-on um, and experience. And definitely, please make sure and leverage your leaders in your office. So.
but uh hope yeah hope that was good hope you guys got some information out of it and uh yeah if any questions come up i'm happy to help and happy to uh, be a resource hey thanks brian thanks a lot all right i appreciate it yeah thank, thank you. you thanks guys thank you yeah so since you guys are all RMLS, that works out well for me because I was going to do RMLS and the other folks were going to go to their other MLSs, but uh, 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 sorry, some, uh, someone was texting me about the Zoom meeting getting ended. Um, one second, guys. And then is it Aisha, Isha? Yeah, Isha here. Are you RMLS as well? Yes. Okay, great, fantastic. So yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do basically what what the nuts and bolts look like of actually getting through an RMLS uh, RMLS presentation. Um, sorry, the the head productivity coach is just texting me because we obviously have that technical glitch and we want to make sure everybody uh, is taken care of. Um, Okay, great. I'm going to let them know that we're moving forward with our MLS. So yeah, we're going to go through the nuts and bolts of, you know, what it's like from beginning to end to do a CMA in using the RMLS's software um, or online platform or however you want to term that. There are, and I'm sure Brian mentioned this, other services you can use as well. Uh, RPR is one to do a CMA, a cloud CMA, I think is what he uses a lot of times. I've never used that interface before. So, I mean... Brian's one of our best, uh, super smart guy. I'm assuming if he uses Cloud CMA, it probably is a good product, um, you know, because he's he's one of our best. So, you know, maybe you kind of explore that option. So one reason why I do really like the RMLS to use for CMAs, though, is I definitely, I also think for a beginner, um, it's not an overwhelming report. It's just a nice, concise report that you can present to a seller that gets straight to the point of, Here's the comps. Here's the price I'm recommending. That's it. Whereas some of these other services, you can get really in the weeds with different things that you can add in there, like, you know, the, the neighborhood's walkability score and all sorts of real estate activity that actually doesn't have to do with the comparables you're using for your property. And they're, you know, 40 pages long. And for me, most sellers do not want a 40 page CMA. And so the RMLS is really great for that. Um, it's just a nice, like I said, straight to the point. Here's the comps. Here's my pricing recommendations. Here we go. Um, so, uh, nope, wrong button. Let's do my... This. All right, mix out most of this stuff. So the house that we're going to be, uh, well, actually, out of curiosity, if any, if anyone can unmute as I'm getting this up and going, who has used the RMLS to create a CMA before? Anybody? I tried. Okay. <laughs> but a little confusing. Okay. And so we'll we'll have this kind of how-to that I'm going to take you through. And then also RMLS is really good about having all their resources and how-tos up on YouTube. So there is about an hour-long video that you can pull from YouTube that is the RMLS, like step-by-step -step how to do a CMA using the RMLS interface. Um, so property that we're going to do a... 
CMA on. I want you guys to have a look at it beforehand so that when we're looking at comparables and I'm kind of talking about a little bit of my thinking and, and, and why I'm choosing these comparables and not, you know what property I'm actually using as a subject property in the first place. So 1024 Hammer Lane, it's one I sold a few years back. The reason I like this to use as an example for a CMA in, in this particular neighborhood um, that it is in here in Eugene, it's a, there's a lot of very similar houses around, single level, similar year built, similar style, similar lot size. And so it's actually a very easy house to comp. Whereas I know at the end of his presentation there, Brian was talking about, you know, sometimes, man, you're going to get a house that you got to comp and it's going to be not easy. It's going to be unique. You're going to be looking for comparables. They're not going to exist. And we're going to have to get really creative on, on how we're going to kind of come up with a, a value for that home. Um, and I would say in those kind of one-off cases, um, partner with your coach. You know what I mean? I think you guys all have Jen up there in Portland you know, she's she's great at what she does. So if you're having a tough time with a CMA and you're just not finding the comparables, hop on office hours with Jen or arrange a time to meet with her and and really kind of work on the CMA. Um, and, you know, even if even if you feel like it's an easy CMA to comp, I have my folks here in Eugene, you know, if they're like, hey, I did this CMA. I'm wondering what you think. I'm like, yeah, send it on over to me. I'll look at the comparables they chose and, and some of those things. And, and we can kind of talk about you know, whether we think that this is a good, a good CMA or not. So anyways, this is the house that we're going to be working on here, uh, built 2001. Um, back when it sold a couple of years ago, it sold for, what did it sell for? Sold for 417. So it was, you know, in those days when it was pretty hot in there in the fall of 21, it was a multiple offer situation. So we went up above asking to to get this house 105.5 uh, percent of list price um but yeah built 2001 the lot size is a 0.14 um it's 1400 square feet three bedroom two bath single level um it's pretty done up inside everything was totally up to date um you know new flooring like bamboo floors new appliances um, you know, new countertops uh, and, and all all the things. So I'll just give you a look through the home here before we uh, before we kind of dive into this here. Just to give you an idea of what we're what we're dealing with. So this is the house that we're going to do a CMA for. So just say that this buyer that I helped buy this a couple of years back, well, now they're ready to sell and move on to something else. And so we're going to figure out what it's worth in uh, late spring 2024. So it's got living and family, we have beautiful bamboo floors. They had redone the kitchen, as you can see. This is not circa 2001. They, they totally updated it. You know, as of the early 2020s, I believe they redid the kitchen. There's the living. You know, the bathrooms are pretty original. This is, I'm sure, what the bathrooms looked like in 2001. Um, for me, it's like frozen just on bedroom number two. I don't know if you're showing anything else. Are you talking to me? Yeah. I didn't catch you. What the? So it, it's frozen on the picture that says bedroom number two for me. Oh. Um, is it frozen for everybody else? Yes. Okay, shoot. Uh, I'm just going to stop my share and then start the share again. Hopefully that unfreezes it for you guys. Thank you for letting me know. Oh, Dana. I've got all our MLS folks here. Okay, I'll go yeah. away then. Sorry, I didn't see you there. I'm sorry. It's all right. Thanks. Bye. So there it is. Are we unfrozen? We should see movement. It's frozen. Ah. <laughs> Man. All I right. see your cursor moving on the screen. I just don't see the anything else. Like I see the property, but I don't see anything but right. vision two. Let me try it. Okay. I'm just gonna share my whole desktop. I think that was the problem because it it did a pop-up for Safari, and that's why. Sorry guys, that's my bad. User error. I got you now. I'm just going to share my whole screen. 
Okay. How about now? Are we on Frozen? Yep. Now I can see it. Sorry. Sorry about that. Okay. So uh, anyways, here's the bedrooms. Uh, there's a walk-in in the primary. Here's the backyard. You know, pretty, pretty basic backyard for this area. Okay. So that's what we're working with uh, inside. Uh, another thing that I like to do is honestly, and this is this is just me when I'm valuing these, and and before I even set in to do the CMA process, what does it say on Realtor? What does it say on RPR? What does it say on Zillow? And just get those couple data points because the all of those sites are using an algorithm to look at comparables and have a computer come up with the price, but it's based off sales data. Is the computer good at choosing comps? No, it's not. It needs a human touch, but it gives you an idea of where you're headed. So um, I'm just gonna go ahead and do that now. And we'll see how close we get to like an average of these three prices when we do our, our CMA. So Zillow's got us his estimate range uh, four, five, six. Okay. Realtor has us four thirty six. And then I'll use RPR. And RPR is a pretty cool site, guys. If you haven't, um, if it's not something you've dove into, A, you can use it to make CMAs. I really like to use it to just kind of spitball prices. Like, you know, a lot of times you'll have buyers that are like, well, what do you think of the price? The site that I kind of trust to go to when I'm just kind of spitballing and like obviously comes with many disclaimers and I'm being like, hey, I haven't done a CMA on this. Hey, da, 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 da. I'm not like, you know, this is not a hill I'm dying on, but I feel like the price is from what I can see pretty OK. Um, and I'll show you what I when you know, I'll show you what I mean by that here in a second. Why? There we go. And so this uh, the point that I was getting at is the RPR is a. Uh, National Association of Realtors Benefits. So we all have this for free using your NRDS number. And RPR has us at 451. So, you know, I'm not a math genius, but if someone else can average these in their head, great. You know, what are we thinking? Probably 445 average of these three prices is where we're... I'm thinking our CMA is probably going to end up somewhere around 445 just based on this data. Um, one reason I like this RPR is because it has a little bit more information than like a, a Zestimate. Um, whereas giving me the, this RVM here, it's giving me a range. Um, the range is a $60,000 swing. So that's a little bit more of a range than I would like to see to feel super comfortable about this price. You know, I'd like that range to maybe be in the, 30 to 40,000 to feel better about the price, but it's also giving me a five-star confidence. And so if I look at what that means, the RVM or AVM confidence score describes the expected accuracy of the property's RVM. Uh, a five-star rating is the highest confidence rating, zero being the lowest. Confidence score is based on the outcomes of multiple automated valuation models. Um, as in, is it finding a lot of good comps in its opinion? And if it, if it feels like it's finding that comp data, it's gonna give you a good confidence score. That's what I also always go to the range here. And, you know, the tighter the range, the better. And the more confident you can feel that this is getting a, a really good price for you. Like I said, this $60,000 swing, it's, it's a little high for me to feel super comfortable that this is right on the money. But we're about to do a CMA on it. So we'll, we'll make that determination on our own right now. Um, this is just some of the things that I kind of go through when I'm, when I'm doing a CMA. Just to let you all know, let's get rid of that. Okay, so CMA, uh, toolkit, CMA profiles. As you can see, I've done a CMA on this before, but we're going to do a new one here. So let's add a new CMA profile, uh, profile name. You can either make it your seller's name or the property address, just so I don't totally mess up my 
other ones that I've done. Let's just call it hammer new. Um, and then you're going to select your contact. So hopefully you have already put your client in your RMLS as a contact because you'll want their name to be there. Um, Sally Seller. Okay, so then the let me just get rid of the faces here. There we go. And if at any point um, anyone has any questions, anything like that, feel free to cut me off. Um, I'm going to kind of minimize everyone's uh, heads going forward, so I won't see it if you're raising your hand. Just feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. I will not be offended. Um, okay, so our subject property here. So one great thing to do beforehand, and I, I did not do this beforehand, so I'm not going to be able to do it, would be to either go on a Google Street View or the old MLS listing if it's largely similar and just do a screenshot of the photo so you can upload this photo to your report. The finished product, what we're going to give to our seller, it looks a lot more finished and polished if you have a property photo to include on your CMA because it's right on the front page and it makes it look really cute. But since I didn't do that work ahead of time, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip it. But my advice to you is have a photo for these CMAs. And the, probably the easiest way to do that, like I said, is just steal a screenshot from a Google Street View or the old listing or some, or do a drive-by of the house before you do the CMA and grab a photo on your phone or something like that. Um, so you can auto-populate the property address information by taking the tax ID. Um, But since I didn't grab the tax ID on the previous screen and I don't want to back out, I'm not going to do that. But all you have to do is in your search, just search for the property, grab the tax ID, plunk it in there, or the old MLS number, plunk it in there, and it will just load in all the property information. All right, so we're 1024. And this is in Santa Clara of Lane County. Gosh. Nine seven four zero four. And then we'll just click that, make sure that the, the dot is in the right place. And if I zoom in here, you can see Hammer Lane. There she is. So we're good with that. And and as I mentioned, I'll just I think it bears repeating. Um, your your final report that you're going to send to the seller will look much better if you do have a photo to place here. Okay, I think we're good there. So as you are going through the CMA, you can either tab through the pages by clicking yourself forward here or just hit forward or back as you want to move through the pages. You can do it either way. So our subject property, I think we have everything we need here except for the photo that I should have done. All right, features. So total square feet, we are 1398, I believe. So another thing that I, I might have done or, or would recommend doing beforehand as well is go into the MLS. If there is a previous listing that you can borrow from as you're filling this out so that you know that you have the most accurate information, do that. Um, also, you can contact your escrow officer and have them pull a list kit or a trio for you. That essentially is like the county records, like what that county has on file for square footage, roofing material, siding material, how big is the garage, that kind of thing. And then here in Lane County, we have, and maybe you guys in Portland have this too, what is called RLID. And this is another resource I use just to verify home facts. This is our county records, essentially. 
And so you might want to have this open while you're doing this as well to make sure that all the all the home facts that you're inputting are are correct. No. Nope. Okay, so here's our here's our R lid report. So it's got our lot size here. Um, it's got our square footage here. Here's what the siding is. You're built. Bedrooms, bathrooms, obviously. What's the style of the roof? What's the material of the roof? Uh, what is the heating as it does on file at the county? Here's how big the garage is. It also has, you know, um, some zoning overlays, um, different information here, obviously. Service providers. So you have, you know, we're Lane Fire Authority, Eugene Springfield Fire, that kind of thing. Um, school districts also. So our elementary school is Irving, middle is Shasta, uh, high school is Willamette High School. So acres, it is a 0.14. Total bathrooms, two. Bedrooms, three. So this part here, um, a lot of this is, is just for your own information. This info here won't appear on the um, CMA necessarily that you give to your client, or, or it won't be as obvious, but when you're choosing comparables, it might be pretty um, useful. Can everybody still hear me? Yes. I can hear you now. All right, well, I just got an info that I just got a pop up that my connection was unstable. So hopefully you guys are still, still with me out there. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this particular house, you know, has no fireplaces, um, but I will, I will go ahead and pull out, you know, some of this thing. We've got an attached garage, um, the heating, is forced air heat pump. Can I choose two? I mean, you can put in the high schools. One important thing about this is a single level. I will not be comparing this to any two story homes, for instance. Um, leave that so main. One story detached home built 2001. Great. So we'll go ahead and save that info. And then we're going to move on to choosing some comparables. So there's a couple different ways. And if you've been in the search feature in RMLS, you know, there's a couple different ways you can search for things in there. Um, you can do like an advanced search where you put in all this criteria and see what kind of homes it spits out. Or you can do like a, a map search or a radius search. Like you pick a point and draw a circle and see what comes up around there, or just uh, you know search by area uh, in that way. So the another thing that you might have done is looked for comps beforehand. And if you have written those MLS numbers down, you can go ahead and just write those MLS numbers from those comps you want to use right here and just hit add and it will bring those comps in if you did the research ahead of time. Or you can use that advanced search here where I said you put in like a bunch of criteria, you know, in that sort of thing and, and bring it in that way. I personally, especially if it's a home, I know I'm going to find decent comps for because it's a house in a, you know, bedroom community that has, you know, a lot of comps right around it. I want to, I want, I'm going to be as greedy as possible when I'm trying to find these comps, especially when I start out. Now, if after my first attempt of being like really greedy with my search criteria, I don't get three or four or five good comps, I might, you know, loosen my search criteria a little bit and see what else I can get to pop up. But at my first pass here and trying to find comps, I'm going to be really, really greedy with this. So let's just start at a half a mile radius. I want to see the actives. I want to see the pendings. Well, I guess if there's a bumpable, I might as well see that. And then let's see the let's see the solds in the last three months. Like I said, really greedy on this first pass through. So because I looked at some pricing already here you know on the zillow and the this and the that and we were thinking you know should be around the 445 area um yeah let's go 
425 to 470 on our range and kind of see what we get. Um, I only want to see three bedrooms. I only want to see two bathrooms. I don't want to go straight too far out of that, at least on my first pass. Now this lot size, this is a very specific lot size. So let's just say, I don't really care how small the lot is because 0.14 is already pretty small, but I don't want to see anything bigger than like a 0.2. Let's try that at the outset. Um, <clears throat> then levels, I only want single levels. Uh, year built, so ours is a 2001, yeah, let's go 1991 to 2011. Let's, I think that's fine to start. And then approximate square feet, ours is being at 1398. Let's try 200 under, 200 over. So that'll be fine. And then I only want detached homes. So I don't want like attached homes or manufactured homes, none of that. I only want detached. So before I even go to try and pull up comps, I can just hit the count button. Well, with this search criteria, I only have one, which is disappointing. I was I was hoping that it would at least give me three there. Let me just make sure that this doesn't change. I just do that now, okay. So the one comp that I have is actually sold. All right, well, that's fine. So the first thing I'm gonna to wanna to do, since I only have one there and that's not gonna be enough to complete this CMA, just go further back in time. Let's try six months. Okay, three. All right, um, that's fine. I'm surprised there isn't more like in the active or pending category, but that's okay. Um, let's just increase our radius a little bit, 0.75. Okay, five. We're doing a little bit better. Let's see what we got. So once you kind of have, you know you're gonna get some data, let's go ahead and hit the search button. So we got a pending and then four solds. So let's take a look at them. Um, all records. And I want the agent full. Okay. Well, I can tell already that we're doing well. Um, so right off the bat here, um, pending on Corbell Street, which is pretty darn nearby. Here's the price right around 445, which is what we expected it to be. Three bedroom, two bath, very similar in square foot. Um, then I'm also just going to kind of like shoot through the notes, see what is to be said there. I'm going to look at heating, cooling, see what's to be said there and see if there's any major differences between this and my, my subject property. And I'm also going to go through the pictures in a pretty quick manner and just make sure that largely... This home is very similar to, to my subject property, obviously, and this makes a good comp. So, stop on the price open concept kitchen, uh, newer HVAC, granite countertops, double oven. Da, da, da. Okay, great. So, let's see what we got here. Sorry to interrupt. Do you mind if I ask you a question? Yes, go for it. So I'm kind of trying to do the CMA on the side while you're talking through it. I oh. might have missed a step. So I'm I'm also, I did the radius search. I actually uh, expanded the radius to five miles, clicked on residential. My price range 400 to 500. And for statuses, I put active and sold. But when I click count, it's giving me zero. How many months back? Uh, I even did 12 months back. What if you just unclick active? Okay. And now what's the council? Um, also zero. Do you, should I share my screen so you can take a look at? Yeah. Um, you... Is that okay? I yeah, don't mean sure. to interrupt your. Oh, that's right. Yeah. You show me your screen. Give me one second here. I, I might have to. Oh, okay. Great. Yeah. Are you able to see it? Okay. Yeah, I can see it just fine. Oh, you're trying to do exactly what I'm I'm doing. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so one reason why you might not get any is on where it says acres, is it is only going to give you comps that are 0.14 acres. Oh. So, it, yeah, if it's any other lot size, it's not a comp as far as that's concerned. Um, so you should get more. Um so just scroll down a little bit more. Yeah. 
So I there's it looks like no property uh there's no property type that is clicked. So go ahead and just hit detached. Right here. Yep. Okay. And then now see what your count is. Okay. Perfect. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I'm very new to Armla. So. And then here's a little tip too. So. Yeah. Say you like then hit search and you like look at all those comps. But you then want to revise your search criteria and you go back that acres spot, it resets every time you go back to it. So you're going to have to change that acres spot every single darn time. Just FYI. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Oh, even if I could revise search right there. Okay. So yeah, I just want to keep on going through this home here. And yeah, you know, largely it's pretty similar. It's not as much my style as the other one but I'm not going to dock it too many points for style. Um, same year built also. I mean, we got 2000 versus 2001. So we're talking a really, really similar home here. Um, and then I want to, oh, I also tend to look at like heating and cooling. So we got heat pump, uh, central air, same as what we got, electricity, gas, same as what we got. Um, so a lot of similar things going on in this listing to our subject property. Okay, so now let's look at the solds. Um, this one's looking pretty darn similar off the bat. So we got 1431 square feet, three bedroom, two bath. We're pretty close there. Uh, sold for, I think that is the sold price. Yeah. Sold for 328.5. That's a little bit, well, it looks like they came out at 335, dropped it to 420, 435, dropped it to 425, ended up selling it for 428.5. Um, forced air heat pump. Beautiful home, comes with recessed lighting, brand new kitchen appliances, new furnace, new heat pump, new water heater, all updates done in 2022, cool. Uh, you're built 1997, that's certainly close enough. Lot size of 0.13, that's close enough. And just take a quick look through the inside. So far, I'm liking this comp just fine. I don't see any reason why this wouldn't be included. And I know it's within 0.75 of a mile from my subject property. And when we're done with this, it'll plot out where our comps are on the map as well. So you'll see how close these actually are. So I, I like that one. Let's keep that. Uh, here's another one on its face. It looks all right. 445. That's about the price we were thinking. Um, our CMA would probably tell us it was worth 1380. Pretty darn close. Three bedroom, two bath, obviously. It's a little bit older in 1994. Um well maintained cul-de-sac okay recently updated interior paint heat pump water heater dishwasher exterior fence and roof so pretty similar to everything that we've looked at so far let's take a look through the inside So yeah, again, I mean, style-wise, I'm going to take our subject property all day long. Um, you know, especially because this trim is, you know, giving very, like, 90s for me, these closet doors, whereas I feel like ours... But then again, ours bathrooms and ours were very 90s, just like this. Um, so, I mean, you know, as far as, like, giving points to mine versus this one, we're not talking much at the end of the day, although I do feel like it looks a little bit more dated where ours was definitely looks like now. Um, okay, but this comp is fine overall. And I think this is our last one here, maybe. Nope, there's two more. So here on Arrowhead, what do we got here? Ryan Meadows, four vaulted ceilings, kitchen range, forced air heating, gas furnace, Oh, look at that driveway. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, in the back. Yeah, very similar size backyard. I'm liking this as a comp as well. We're at 455, three bedroom, two bath. We're only about 50, 50 square feet off. 1997, so it's a little bit closer than the year built. Our lot size is right on. Um, we got heat pump, electric, gas. Yeah, this is pretty darn close. I'm liking this one pretty well. They came out at 450. No, they 
Original price was four fifty, but then list price four sixty five, but then sold price four fifty five. Well, I'm not sure what happened here. Oh, and he's from my office, so I could probably I could probably find out what happened here. Why the original price and the list prices? It's very rare to see something come out at four fifty, but then have a price change up to four sixty five. That's that's odd. Okay, and then this one here on Chimney Rock. Um, so this one's a bit bigger. We're, we've got 150 square foot difference on this one. Um, still a three bedroom, two bath. This one did go for 460. So a little bit higher than what we've been seeing. Um, spent 45 days on the market. Uh, it's a little bit older, um, built in 94. Uh, it, like a good listing agent, they put what the seller paid in concessions. Um, so Sweet one level home, diligently maintained. Newer hardwood floors. Black granite counter, gas appliances. Okay, let's take a look on the inside. Right, let's see in this kitchen here. The floors look nice. Uh, so update appliances, original cabinetry, that's okay. That was pretty consistent through most of these, that especially in the bathrooms, you know, all, all that work looked pretty circa when they were built in the, you know, mid to late 90s. So and very similar size lot and layout that all looks pretty darn the same to me. Um, let's look at our info here at the bottom. So this one came out at 480. They dropped to 475, ended up letting it go for 460 on a conventional loan. Um, good information to have. So, I mean, and this is stuff also that you, you want to look at these so that when you're having that pricing conversation with your seller, you can discuss how, you know, this one chased the market where they came out at a price that was too high and you know waited a little bit of time if time is of the essence for your seller you know some sellers have time to wait and they think you know oh well let's just try it at my price if i don't sell it in a month i i have that time and then we can drop it and that's a conversation with your seller but at least you're armed with the information that pricing it too high out of the gate tends to have you in a position where you are chasing the market and then you're getting Buyer's agents calling you being like, well, what's wrong with it? Why hasn't it sold? Even though nothing's wrong with it. The, the only thing that was wrong with it was the price. Um, so uh, some info there. Okay. So let's go to our results again. And so long as all these are checked, you're going to hit add to CMA. So it's going to bring all of these in to our 1024 Hammer New profile. Let's go ahead and hit next and save and next. And then we can have these in whatever order we kind of want. If we want them to appear to the seller in a certain order, I'm happy to just have the pending at the top and the solds come after. Sometimes you have a comp that you think, I mean, it's just, it's like the house is twin, right? It like sold two months ago and it's like your subject properties like twin. And so you might wanna have that comp at the top because you're like, boom, right here. This tells us everything we need to know basically in this one comp because your house is exactly this house. Um, in this case, I really didn't feel that way. I don't know that one comp, well, there was one that actually probably did stand out. It was, I probably like the pending the best, but here's the problem. Because it's only pending, we don't know what the final sales price is going to be. We only know what they listed it at. We don't know what price the seller accepted, under what terms, if they're covering closing costs. I mean, who knows? Um, but yeah, I think our best comp was probably uh, this one on Corbell. Um, okay, so now at this point, if you want to go back and search for some more comparables, maybe we expand our search criteria a little bit more. I think if I were to go back and search for more uh, search for more comparables, the way in which I would expand my criteria isn't by square foot or age or any of that stuff. I'd probably just go from 0.75 of a mile to a mile. 
and that and I would just see what else additional came up in that case um, just to get a little bit more data in here because just knowing that area like I do Santa Clara a mile radius from where this house is everything around there it's like the same type of community similar type housing and I don't think that it's too big of a, a sin so to speak to increase it just a quarter of a mile in Santa Clara here um and you know that's just my feeling because I, I know the area well and that would probably be the one change I would make to try and bring in some more comp to this report I'm not really going to bother doing that right now but just to let you know that's probably what I would do to, to get some more data in here um just so we have more to build an average off of although I don't think we're doing too bad here so far this is okay so next is the adjustments page I want to caution you here with these adjustments. So one of the reasons that in that one screen, it has you put in um, like the schools and the, the year built and the style and those things is so you can compare yours to the comps that you're choosing side by side in some of those things, um, or the comp I should say, and then yours side by side. So it just kind of helps you if you are to be making adjustments. I want to caution heavily making adjustments, especially, especially for like, oh, well, mine has a heat pump. The other one doesn't have a heat pump. So I'm going to make in this thing, like a little swing here. And you, you can um, be, you know, basically be like, I want to dock the comp 5,000 in the negative because it didn't have a heat pump. And actually, that probably isn't even enough money. I probably should do more, which is exactly my point. Until you get really, really comfortable with like how much is a how much is a mini split worth? How much is newer stainless steel appliances versus older? You know, you have to be able to put a value to that and put an accurate value to it. And I caution you in doing that because coming up with those sorts of valuations really tends to steer into the job of an appraiser more than like a real estate agent. As a real estate agent, I think we're good at looking at the comps and bringing in those comparables and then making that average based on the comps. Less so making these micro adjustments with very specific dollar amounts for a little bit of a thing here, a little bit of a thing there, a little bit of a thing here. And also from my experience, what I see tend to happen is, okay, so maybe I've got this comparable I want to use here, and I've got my subject property I want to use here. Well, I'm going to dock my comparable 5K because they don't have this. But then I'm going to dock my subject property 5K because it doesn't have this compared to the comparable. And this, and then you do these little things, and a lot of times it just ends up being a wash anyways. If you're choosing good comps, like, like we did. I mean, I went through, I set my search criteria pretty tight. And then I look through to make sure that those houses were largely similar to my subject property. I'm satisfied with those comps. I don't feel the need to necessarily go in and play appraiser and put these dollar amounts to these things and make these little adjustments. And I, I really want to caution you guys heavily against doing that. If you want to do that, there are other systems. And especially if you've got a comp, say, it's not like this one where you're not finding comparables. You're not finding things that are similar. You've got a unique property. And so adjustments need to be made. I think that there are other systems that might be superior to the RMLS to make those adjustments where you're not going in here and kind of playing appraiser and doing these like micro, like really like specific dollar amount adjustments. So like RPR, for instance, if you make a CMA in here, which you can do, um, and since I've already done one, I wonder if I can just bring it up for you guys really quick. And then I'll go back to the RMLS one. I, I don't want to sidetrack you guys, I promise. Um, okay, great. So yes, I have done a CMA for this here in, in RPR for a couple of years ago. That's why the prices aren't, aren't quite right. So here in RPR, the way you make adjustments is like this. So we've got our subject property here. And say this one here, we think that this one is is you know, on a 10 scale, if ours is a five and this one's a 10, we're going to drag this over. How does this property compare to the subject? Better all the way. And then it's actually going to swing our, our comp analysis by this 8K here. Um, 
and then say this comp, we just, you know, condition wise, it's not there, it's not up to date, and we think it's X worse. So we slide that down compared to our subject property. But again, a lot of times what ends up happening is you make this one better because you think it's better. You make this one worse because you think it's worse. And then you get to the end and you're like, oh, it kind of zeroed out. So again, just unless you have a really good reason and you have a lot of data behind you to be making these little adjustments, if you've chosen really good comps as it is, you really don't need to make these small adjustments, in my opinion. Or if you do, we can make them not here, but in our price recommendation. And I'll show you that in a minute. So we're, we're about to get to there. I just wanted, that's just kind of my long disclaimer about don't masquerade as an appraiser unless you have a reason to make these adjustments and you have the data like, oh, my subject property has no heat. Well, I guess it has to have heat in some way, but say, you know, it just has like a baseboard heater in some of the bedrooms and all your comparables I and have like mini splits or heat pumps. Sure, you might want to dock your subject property you know, 7,500 to 15K for that lack of a nice heating and air conditioning system. We don't have to do it on this page. Um, so there's that for you guys. Okay. Recommended price. So here, based on the comps that we chose, it's telling us several things. Our average sold price of the four solds that we brought in were 447 uh, 309 a square foot. I don't get too much into square feet because obviously the, honestly, the bigger the house that you have, the price per square foot tends to go down. Um, and so it's kind of can be apples to oranges sometimes. Um, but it does give us a good example as to whether we're on the right track. And I'll get to that in a second. So the minimum list price for the four, for the five comps that we chose was 425. That's where the the one that came out at the lowest came out at 425. The average list price of the five that we're looking at were 451. Uh, and then the max list price was 475. Now, remember when we looked at that 475 one, they ended up selling that thing for less. They dropped the price and then sold, and then they went, they sold it for even less than that. Um, so yeah, average sold price, 309 a square foot, average list price, 317 a square foot. So that's kind of what we're thinking here with what we want to come up with for, for ours. So the other thing before I go to fill in this recommendation is I want to look at some of these, these stats here. So of our solds, average price, 447. And then our pending one, again, we don't know what the sold price is there, um, but that's what, it, that's what it listed at. Um, our average square feet of our solds, you know, pretty close there. Our average days on market. And then here we have um, a little graph for us. And once I put in our price recommendation, this graph will actually become even better. So let's go ahead and let's go ahead and make some price recommendations here. So based on everything that I've seen, and even the work that we had kind of done beforehand, looking at RPR, Realtor, Zillow, this is all matching up with the data that I kind of expected that we would see. And that's that I really think that our, like our price that we should come out at, if we want to be neither conservative nor aggressive, I would say would be Well, I'll make this a discussion because we have 20 more minutes I can take up of yours. So we'll make we'll we'll play around with a couple numbers here. So if I'm wanting to, I know that my seller isn't going to want to be super aggressive with their pricing, but I'm also in my CMA not going to then overcompensate myself and have them be super conservative with the pricing because ultimately I want to price have them price it at a price that's going to cause it to sell. So in my recommended price, I'm going to go ahead and say 445, which will have us at 318 a square foot. That looks about right. So the minimum price that I would want them to come out at, I would say, man, I mean, if we could come out at 435, I bet this listing would get a lot of attention. Uh, potentially, you know, it's gotten a lot hotter out there. A lot more of my clients right now are, are 
hot after it out there writing offers. I've seen a lot of competitive situations where homes have been going for multiple offers. It just is that season right now, early June. And so I think, you know, honestly, I think 445 is the minimum of what we should get for this house um, and what it's worth. I bet if we put it out there for 435 um, and we're aggressive with it, that we get some attention, hopefully multiple offers, and we could get this thing to go above 450, I would hope. Personally, based on what I've seen with the pricing, especially seeing that one house come out at 475, granted it was a little bit bigger, but even it ended up going for 460. So I'm going to say that the max my seller should come out at is probably going to be 460. And I think that that's a pretty good recommendation. If I'm honest, I probably want this to be more like 440 because that's just going to generate that much more attention for this house. Um, I think that that's probably a magic number to list at for me. But depending on what I know about my seller, if I already kind of know that, well, they've looked at Zillow and they've looked at this and they're really thinking 450 or 455 and my odds of even getting them to go at 445 are slim, I might not recommend a price of 440. Yes, it's kind of what I want them to come out at, but you know, we'll, we'll go 445. For, for their sake. We'll talk about it. That's what the listing appointment's all about. Um, so then I'm going to refresh this graph. So now it's put my pricing recommendation versus these comparables. So look what's happening here. And this will be what you'll kind of talk about your, with your seller here. So at our minimum price, here is the blue line. That's going to have us listing at below the average sold price. The reason that I want to list it there though, is to generate the maximum amount of attention and try and get a multiple offer scenario, uh, multiple offer scenario happening right now, which is happening right now for well-priced homes. If you look at my green line, which is my recommended price, man, that is right on the money to the average sold price of these homes. And truly that 445 price is the price that I, 445 to 450 is what I believe this house is worth. And what my seller should get out of it is that 445 to maybe 450. And that price is right on the money to where the average sold price is for the comps that I chose. Then that 460 price that I put in, it is higher than the average list price for those sold properties. So they can see right there that if they want to go with my max recommended price, that they are actually listing higher than average for the comps that I've chosen. And you can have that conversation, you have that data right here to kind of help sway them in the right direction to price, to have them price this house for a house that's, for a price that's going to cause it to sell. Because right here, you can very clearly see if you price it at 460, that's higher than the average of what these comparables have priced for. And we don't want to be chasing the market. You know, we, we know what that does. So, you know, a lot of your discussion can kind of be had right here. Here's the comps in the gray. Here's my price recommendations in the lines. And you can, I think it kind of speaks for itself. Um, here's another thing right here. So of these four sold, the sold property is closed averaging 98.81% of their final list price. So, you know, if we're talking two years ago, three years ago in 2021, when I did this property originally, this was more like homes were selling at 105% of their list price. This is just, will help you set expectations as well. Um, as far as what is the market doing? On average, those four comps that we chose, they got close to 100% of what the seller was asking for it, but a little bit under. And that's just where the market is right now. Um, and all that data is here for your discussion with your seller. Um, okay, so next, your cover page. Again, this is blank because I did not drag and drop a um, nice photo of my listing here. Your report will look better if you do so. So I'm just going to say blank space. This features thing here. I would use this features thing if you can. So chances are you're not just doing the CMA out of nowhere. You've had a conversation with your seller about their home. Um, they've told you some of the facts and features, the things that they love about it. Um, I might even ask my seller, excuse me, in our initial conversations, what um, what are some things that you really like about this home? And they might be like, oh, you know, great neighbors, or it's right next to this amazing park, or we had the floors redone in this beautiful bamboo flooring. So, you know, I would use that to show your seller that you were listening to them 
in your consultation and say, oh, you know, new bamboo floors across from, you know, I don't know, Hyde Park. I'm just making that up. And uh, new, new heat pump. And these will appear on your report, which you're about to see. Um, you can also make some comments. So uh, I had someone not that long ago do a CMA and they sent it to me and they had had some discussions with their seller beforehand. It was kind of a distressed property. It was a hoarder situation where A, there was a, just a ton of deferred maintenance um, and the seller was not in a position where they were going to be, to be able to remove all of their personal belongings before the new person took over. So we were literally listing it as like, yes, bring your offer, tons of deferred maintenance, and the buyer will be responsible for the junk removal. And so because that have factored heavily into his price, he put those comments here, just so that the seller kind of knew where he was coming from in the pricing, which reminds me, I wanna go back to this. So I was talking to you guys about adjustments uh, a little bit ago and making those like micro adjustments and this, that, and the other. <clears throat> There's nothing stopping you from instead of trying to make those adjustments like that, say that you've been looking through your comps and of the four or five comps that you chose, every single one of them had updated the flooring, updated all the kitchen appliances, had a newer roof and um, so on and so forth. And you just felt like yours, you know, the roof was looking aged um, they hadn't updated the appliances and, you know, you kind of came up with a value that you were thinking maybe it was, you know, you want to take off 10, 15,000 from the price just to kind of make up for some deferred maintenance maybe or something like that. Instead of doing on that adjustments page, you can just do it right here. So if you want to take a little bit of value off to compensate for some things that you're seeing, just do it in your recommended pricing range. And then you can make some comments here on the comments page as to maybe why you think that, or just maybe not make any comments and just kind of have that conversation when you're you know, on your listing appointment or you're discussing the CMA. So you don't have to use this adjustments page, in other words, to, to make those swings. Um, you can just kind of factor it in when you're coming up with your recommended price. Um, okay, contents pages. So here's a couple things to, to note. Um, you can include a page that has company information, you can include your resume. You can include a signature optional page, so on and so forth. To do those things, you need to go into your back office in the MLS. No, wait, not your back office. Your toolkit. And then go into your user preferences. Definitely update your headshot. Make sure all your contact information is in there. And then if you want any of these other things to appear, like I said, like this resume or company, company info, you're going to need to add it in, in your user settings and preferences in the RMLS for it to appear on these reports. Um, otherwise, it will be blank for you. Um, <clears throat> so then here on the report, what do I want to include? Um, the cover page? Yes, I want that. The table of contents? I really don't need that. Uh, I will include it. I'm going to include everything on my first run of the report so you guys can see it. And then I'll go back, eliminate some of these things and then run it again. And then for me, it looks better without including some of these unnecessary things. Um, okay, great. So I'm, I want all these pages to be included. Let's run it. Next, generate report. Okay, so here it is. Competitive market analysis for Sally's seller. If I had taken a picture of the property, that picture would be right here. 1024 Hammer Lane, 97404, acres, bedrooms, bathrooms, new bamboo floors across from Hyde Park, new heat pump. And then it's got my recommended pricing right here on the front. I am recommending that we list at 445. That's what I think it's worth. That's what I think we should get for it. We can be a little bit more aggressive, try and drum up a um, hopefully multiple offer situation, get a lot of showings in those first couple of weeks, maybe come out at 435. Um, I could see that being a really successful strategy. The max I would want to list for is 460. Even at 460, I feel like we might be chasing the market a little bit. Um, just given what the comps are telling me, it, it prob we're probably not going to get 460 out of this house. Um, 
but that's ultimately the seller's decision. Again, if you do not fill in your headshot, your KW logo and all this info in your preferences in RMLS, they will not appear there. Table of contents. I'm gonna eliminate this page because I don't see how it's really appropriate for a what will end up being like a seven page report in the end. Here's my signature page. Kind of pointless. I'm gonna take it out. Um, okay, so then it gets into the comparables. Here's what we chose. Uh, this is the pending that's on the market right now. Again, we don't know what the final sales price is going to be, but it does give us some good data, especially since they came out at 448999. That's really close to what we want to be coming out at. And I think it was probably our best comp, honestly. Um, then it goes into these other comps. These are all the solds. Okay, so there's the end of our comps. Here is the map of the comparables to the home. Um, and so your seller can see, and I mean, these are very close by to this home. Uh, these are very, very close by. So your seller can see, you know, where are these comps? Um, at in relation to their home, I would definitely not eliminate this page. Here are, so if you did make any adjustments, those adjustments are going to appear here and the dollar amounts will be shown in these columns versus your subject property here. Or no, here, this is our subject property, sorry. So if you did make adjustments, that's where it will show. Since I didn't make any, I'm going to go ahead and eliminate this page. And then here's adjustments continued. Summary of comparables. This is just a different way of maybe looking at it for our seller. Maybe they are the type of person that might see things a little bit better from this perspective. So I think I'll leave the summary in. Pricing your home. This is the most important page. This is what I kind of spent all that time talking to you guys about as far as, you know, um, especially like if we come out at... Uh, 445, we're looking at roughly $318 a square foot. Our average list price was at $317 a square foot. So we're like right on the money with that pricing. Uh, again, the graph here, I think this is a really powerful graph. It shows that the price that I'm recommending, the 445 is right in line with where our comps are telling us we should be priced at. I'm seeing something in the chat here. Okay, thanks Taylor, or Ryan, sorry. Um, and then, um, so yeah, this page is like most of the conversation that I'm going to be having with my seller is going to be around this page right here. Um, and then here's some company information. So if this looks familiar to you, that's because I went to Wikipedia and looked up Keller Williams, copied the screen and pasted it into this. And that's why I have this company information here. Um, I'm actually not going to include it in the CMA because I don't think the seller really cares. Uh, resume, if you have one, here's my resume page. I never put a resume in here because I, I don't want one. Um, so I'm going to go back to my options. I'm going to get rid of the table of contents. I'm going to get rid of the signature page. I'm going to get rid of the adjustments page. I'll keep the summary. Goodbye, company resume. Goodbye, my resume. And then goodbye, optional page two. And we're going to run it again. So here it is again our comparables, our map, summary of comparables, pricing strategy, and we're done. So what is this, five pages? And that's why I think to start with as a newer agent, RMLS is a great way to start because it doesn't have you getting sidetracked in a whole bunch of other things with, with making your CMA. Because ultimately, let me go back to RPR and just kind of show you a... a the opposite of what the RMLS uh, CMA does. So let me get out of this. Uh, yeah, close the page, I don't care. So let's create a report here in RPR. So I wanna create a seller's report. Right now it's approximately 81 pages long. 81 page CMA. I, I, I just can't imagine any seller out there wanting to receive an 81 page CMA. 99% of sellers, well, maybe not 99, but you know what I mean. They're like, well, they want to know what you think you should list it for. What's it worth? How much am I going to get for my house? Um, so an 81 page CMA is absolutely wild. And in RPR here, you can pare it down just like you can in the MLS. So here, all these check boxes are all the things that are going to be included in this CMA. So 
obviously I want a subject property summary, you know, and all these things are, are part of the, part of the comp analysis. Home facts, homeowner facts, sure. Let's include those. Okay, that we don't want. Airb livability in fact, index, uh, refined value, all this stuff, getting rid of it, assess value. So all of this stuff, market activity, market health, this is like gonna print out pages and pages and pages of sure things that have sold, but not good comps. It's gonna be two story houses that are 2,200 square feet and built in 1910 and manufactured homes and park. It's basically all the comp data that it can possibly pull in that has nothing to do with the property you're trying to sell. So I'm gonna get rid of all of that. Um, again, recent market activity, I don't need it. Market activity, I don't really want this stuff. Unless there's like some really good data in there, it is literally gonna show you all the pendings, all the recently solds, whether they're good comps for your subject property or not. And a lot of it just tends to just be just extra information that just it is not necessary. Um, expired listings, can't imagine there are very many. Obviously recommended pricing strategy, I will leave in. My refined value, I'll leave in. My comp analysis, I will leave that in. Um, I don't like the net sheet that this does, so I'm gonna get rid of that and I will get rid of the RPR disclaimer. So I don't know how many pages I'm down to at this point, but um, you can run the report. And while it's running, I wanna show you guys one other thing. Um, because a lot of times when you are on these listing appointments and doing these CMAs with your seller, oh, it's, is it already done? No. Um, <clears throat> and doing these things with your seller, they want to know how much they're going to um, net. Oh, it's done. Great. So again, the, the main reason that I showed you the RPR is because I like the way that you can adjust with the slider. I think it gets us maybe into a little bit less hot water masquerading as appraisers and knowing these really specific values to certain things when we maybe don't um, until we kind of have that experience. Um, thanks. Um, so again, here's what the report looks like for RPR. Again, you'll need to kind of preload. Wow, I look way different in that picture. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, preload your logo and all that stuff for it to appear on the report. Um, how many how many pages we got here? That didn't seem too bad. Anyways, it looks a bit different. It's it certainly has a more polished look to it than the RMLS report does. Which I mean, RMLS it has a very HTML look, like early internet kind of vibe to it, where. <clears throat> You know, the RPR definitely has a more polished look to it, um, kind of like it's an app-based interface and, and whatnot. So I like it for those reasons. Um, but I would say all in all, especially when you're starting out, RMLS is probably a little bit easier A to Z, whereas there's just more to RPR. I've never used Cloud CMA, but I know Brian, who gave the presentation earlier, Cloud CMA is something that he uses to do his CMAs. Maybe it's amazing. I mean, he seems to like it, so... I mean, if it's good enough for Brian, it probably is good enough for us, I would imagine. So yeah, here's um, an idea of, of what it looks like through RPR. So he, and here's going to be the main crux of your conversation with your seller. You know, here's what RPR has as, as a value and a range. Um, based on the comps that I chose two years ago when I made this CMA, it was at 435. I'm sure if I updated it for now, it would be closer to the price that we set for it. Um, and you can put in your own range just like you can in RMLS. Okay, so very last thing. Do you still mostly use um, MLS? What do you I call do. It? I do. That, that's just my preference. For a long time, I did use RPR. Um, but eventually I was kind of like, what am I doing? This is not better. More is not always more. And I, I truly do use RMLS most of the time now. And, and I think really the reason for that is, is like the seller knows their neighborhood probably better than I do. The seller mm -hmm. knows all these other home facts about their home probably better than I do. So I don't need RPR to be throwing all this data that doesn't have anything to do with how we're going to price the home at them. They already know they live there. Um, mm -hmm. So let's just get down to what we're there to do. And that's come up with the, like the price, we, the comps, the price strategy. That's what it's all about with the CMAs. 
Um, so if you are doing a net sheet for your sellers, I mean, we all have our preferred escrow company. So if you're using Tycor, you can probably go to use their net sheet calculator if you're using First American or whoever. Uh, my escrow preference tends to be Western. I work with Kelly over there and I just really like them. The other thing I like about them is they have the best net sheet. So oftentimes when you're presenting these CMAs, the other thing the seller wants to know is how much are they going to walk away with if you sell it for, in this case, let's say 445, like we came up with. So I'm just going to really go through this fast. KW. And the reason that you want to be specific with these counties is because it will take into account your county taxes and the tax year and things of that nature. Um, Eugene, so estimated close date, let's say we're anticipating we're gonna close 31st of July. Property address, 1024. Uh, escrow fees typically split 50-50 between the buyer and the seller. And then definitely put in what the property taxes are for this property. Um, I'm just gonna take a guess and say they're 3,500 bucks. Um, so since it is, uh, June, the taxes are paid. Um, and then of course, from real estate school, they are unpaid from July 1st until usually November. And then would actually, that would be when they're due not. Uh, so the tax bill, what becomes due in October. So that's usually when you would hit that, but they're not payable until typically November, which then most folks typically pay them and they become paid. Anyways, you'll you'll know if your taxes are paid or unpaid or due or not payable. Be, but I know because it's June, the taxes are definitely paid. Um, so I'm creating a seller estimate. Is that? Okay. So, you know, sorry, seller. Chances are you don't have a buyer at this point. Really a buyer. Uh, we're going to go off our final sales price of four forty five. Um, pay off, let's say they owe to, uh, you know, umqua the mortgage. Pay off, uh, let's say they still owe, I don't know, 290. And let's be really optimistic and say that it's a 6% commission, three to each side, or six bananas. Um, And then they're going to prorate the taxes. So miscellaneous credits. Now let's say in this, in maybe you want to give your seller two net sheets. One, if they're giving closing cost credit and one, if they're not going to give closing cost credit. So let's just say that, you know, you're, you've had the discussion with the seller and they thought, you know, I might be willing to do a closing cost credit up to $10,000. Oh, wait, no, sorry. Oh, you know what? I think that's a credit to the seller. Yep. Nope. That's a credit to the seller. Apologies. Let me get rid of that. So anyways, um, prorated taxes, title and escrow fees. And these are real title and escrow fees that, you know, Western will charge. Um, the reconveyance processing fee, local government lien search fee. And then here we go. And let's just say maybe they're willing to go. Oh, it's already it's already written there for us. And go back. And then print estimate. And so you can bring this nice little thing over to your seller. Um, sales price. They're going to pay off the mortgage. They're going to pay the commissions. Um, obviously, how the tax pro rates will work out. <clears throat> escrow fees, and then if they contribute $10,000 towards closing costs, your seller stands to take home after the sale is done just under two hundred or just under $120,000 if, you know, all these numbers are obviously accurate. So I just kind of wanted to show you that net sheet because oftentimes it is part of the conversation you're going to have with your sellers uh, in the CMA. So I think I only have a couple of you left. Yeah. So um, again, if you kind of need to go through this process again, you can request the recording of me going through it. 
or RMLS has their own recordings of the CMA process beginning to end, just like I just kind of showed you guys. And I'm sure that they probably have other couple tips that I didn't say. Um, so it might be interesting look to kind of get a different perspective from RMLS themselves on, on how they teach the process as well. Um, and like I said, Cloud CMA is another service you can try or RPR is another. And then I, I don't know if Cloud CMA costs money uh, and what the deal is with that, but uh, RPR is a free member benefit for NAR. You just need to know your NRDS number and you can get logged into RPR. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was what I had for you guys. Thanks for sticking with me for so long. I appreciate it. <laughs> I appreciate you too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.